Ever since they bought their first glass sculpture in 1986, they have collected outstanding glass art from the U.S. and around the world. Along with other collectors and artists, they have actively promoted glass art for many years, and it has become an integral part of their home and their lives. On this edition of Art Now, we'll look at the contemporary glass art collection of John and Judith Liebman. Hi, welcome to Art Now. I'm Pat Salmon and I'll be your host. Our guests today are John and Judith Lieberman, who are both retired professors of engineering from the University of Illinois. John also was the head of the Department of Civil Engineering and Judith was the Vice Chancellor of Re for Research and Dean of the Graduate College. Ever since they bought their first glass sculpture in 1986, John and Judith have been actively involved in exploring, collecting, and promoting glass art. John is a past president of the National Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass, and both he and Judith are currently advisory board members. John is also on the board of the Pilchuck Glass School near Seattle, an internationally known center for the training and development of glass artists. John and Judith, thanks for being with us today. We're happy to be here. Okay, uh, first question I'd like to ask is, how did you first get interested in contemporary glass art? We, we were building a summer home in Colorado, and we realized suddenly we needed not only furniture, but we needed accessories. Mm -hmm. So we found ourselves in the River North, wandering through galleries, and we wandered into one that had nothing but glass sculptures. Mm -hmm. And we saw a piece that we'll talk about later that just struck us. We loved it, but it was not an accessory price. So we walked away. Mm -hmm. Two minutes, to, to two or three months later, we're back in River North, and we find we're nudging ourselves towards that gallery. We walked in, the piece was there, the price hadn't changed, and we bought it. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you think your backgrounds in engineering help you to better appreciate the techniques the glass artists use? I think that part of our interest in glass is the techniques because we got engineering backgrounds. I find I'm fascinated always with how do they do that mm -hmm. sort of questions. So yeah, I, it certainly makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, now I know you've had many opportunities to meet and talk with prominent glass artists. Uh, have you found that knowing the artists gives you a different perspective on their work? Oh, very much. Very much. And when, we'll, when we get to talking about the uh, piece by Stephen Dahm, I'll tell you when you speak with the artist and you can find out what inspired them to do that piece, it's really illuminating. Right. I, I think you, you really understand pieces better when you know something about the artist. And you, you can relate to an artist's sense of humor. Mm. Sometimes yes. if you see the piece and you don't know the artist, you don't even really realize that it's humorous at all. And suddenly, when you know something about the artist's background, you right. understand what he's saying. That's great. Um, how do you decide whether to purchase a piece of art? What, what are your criteria for, for uh, selecting a piece? Well, firstly, we have, we have an absolute rule, which is we both have to like it. It's and, probably a good rule. <laughs> and, well, as I've said before, that's the only thing that keeps it keeps us from being bankrupt <laughs> because it, it limits the purchases to some extent. That in space in the house. Uh, we certainly look for quality, quality of workmanship. Uh, for a long time we were, we were really attracted by the optical qualities of glass and I think that's often what people start with when sure. they begin to get interested in glass. And only later do you get intrigued with things that don't have those qualities. Uh, we don't necessarily look for beauty, although 
I don't think we want any really ugly pieces in the right. house. Right. <laughs> so there, there's some of that. Uh -huh. Very good. Uh, what have you both most enjoyed about being collectors? Oh, living with it, viewing it, learning about it, mm -hmm. meeting other collectors, of course, meeting the artists. Yeah, I, I was going to emphasize that the glass art community is a very tight community. Everybody knows everybody. The artists, the collectors, even the gallery owners. And there's a real camaraderie amongst those people. That's, that's a lot of fun. And we have really enjoyed that. That's great. Well, we're going to move to another room now so we can begin looking at just a few of the many pieces that you have in your collection. The first piece uh, we're going to look at is by, uh, is called Memory Alley and it's by Alex Fakit, um, who actually got his degree at the University of Illinois, but he is Czech. Um, would you like to say a bit about this piece? Yeah, Alex was on the faculty for some time at the University of Illinois in industrial design, not in the art department. And he began doing glass uh, sort of as a side thing, and now he has left the university and is doing uh, glass as his uh, primary occupation. Uh, it's a combination of, of glass and rusted metal that he has put together. Uh, and it's a it's a rather unusual piece. Not many people do this kind of kind of work, and he's had to do a lot of cold work on it to do the cutting uh, that makes all those shapes uh, after the piece is blown. And he is a glass blower, so it starts as a blown piece, and then it's been cut uh, since then. So it makes a very nice uh, wall piece right over the bed. Did you want to add anything? No, 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 no. I'm okay, <laughs> great. Okay, uh, the next piece we're going to look at is uh, called Flight Line. It's by Catherine Newell. Yeah, this is the this is the piece up up high, and it's actually seven pieces. Uh, and everybody looks at this and thinks that that she has drawn on it, and and the I guess in a sense it's drawing, but it's really not. Uh, the individual pieces are all uh, pot de ver glass, that is glass that's been uh, cut into or ground into powder and then, and then uh, kiln formed so that it all fuses together. But the images on the piece are made of glass powder, which is put on before she fuses it and is sprinkled on, uh, sometimes using straws to blow it into the into the right place, uh, and then the whole thing is fused in a, in a kiln. Uh, it's amazing that she can get as, as delicate a line as she does for some of these. Uh, they're so, such delicate pieces, and to have them done by, by putting glass powder into place is really quite striking. And I think they're quite beautiful pieces as well. Does she usually have birds as a theme, or? She does a lot of things. She does birds. She's done birds several times. She does. Uh, uh, she's done a whole set of things with people's faces on them, mm, and okay. she'll she'll group, as she did with the birds here. She'll group a half a dozen or so different people's right. faces. Okay, and then uh, next piece we have here is actually uh, the surround for the fireplace. Yeah, Which when, is gorgeous. <laughs> when, we, when we built the house, uh, we actually stole the idea f from somebody else. We had seen a, a small fireplace surround with small tiles made of glass. And we talked to Bill Carlson, who at that time was the professor of glass here at the University of Illinois, uh, about doing a surround for the fireplace here. And he... Uh, he came up with this. The, the tiles are uh, a foot square and they're uh, 
quite thick, ranging from two to three and a half inches thick. And then they've been mirrored on the back, which is what makes it all so shiny. And then, then the, the gas fireplace in the middle, uh, it, they, it, it, it makes a very nice effect. Yeah, when the fire is inside, it's like fire and ice. I mean, it's Ooh. really a nice combination. You're right, I can see that. Okay, and then uh, the third piece here uh, is Turquoise Sahara Mesa by Jose Chartier. Jose also was on the faculty here for, for about 10 years in, in the glass program. He's a Cuban-born uh, but American-raised artist, and uh, he has done a whole series of these, he calls them his Mesa series, uh, of these pieces that have a sort of a table and then several blown and hot worked pieces on the table or penetrating the table. The newer ones of these that he's been making, instead of having four legs, the whole base is solid. Oh my. And there is a colored piece of some sort inside the solid base that you see in a sort of a haze. And I have my ambition to have another one of Jose's Mesas, but I'm not sure when that will happen. Oh, there's space oh. the other side of the fireplace, John. <laughs> there you go. There are places to play. <laughs> there's still a little room. There's still a little room. <laughs> okay, we'll be moving on then to the great room. The next piece we're going to look at is uh, a can one of the Canopic Jar series uh, called Mountain Lion, and it's by William Morris. William Morris has been a, an astounding glass artist. He worked for, he started as a truck driver working for Dale Chihuly because he didn't have the money to take, officially take lessons from him. And then he mm -hmm. worked up to be on his crew mm -hmm. and then went on his own and became what we think is the, the best artist in the world. He has just recently retired. When he, he blows the jar and he does the head, blows the head separately and in the jar when he was doing the jar to get the pattern on it he makes the pattern of uh, of the animals using ground glass and spreading it on a steel table gets the design the way he wants it takes the hot glass vessel rolls it mm. along the table to pick up the design and then blows the vessel a little more so it becomes even larger okay then you see the cracks in there are not really cracks, oh. essentially. He takes this hot glass vessel and he dips it into cold water, which produces the cracks. And then he quickly takes this vessel and puts it back in, in dips it in clear glass, hot glass, okay. to seal up, the, seal up right. the cracks. And then he has that vessel done and that's put away, and then he works on the head, the mountain lion head, starts out by a blowing a, a glass object, and then we're using tweezers, something that looks like tweezers, mm -hmm. pulls it out, makes the shapes, use, uses glass powder to uh, put in the features. It's just amazing. We've seen him do jars, we've not seen him do this one. We were in New York City in Heller Gallery, and we walked in, and we took one look at that and said, we have to have it because it was, we had the house in the mountains and it's a mountain lion. Right. So that's, right. A, that's a history of our getting that piece. Great, very good. One, the thing that we particularly find about Bill Morris is that he's, he's just tremendously innovative. His work doesn't follow anybody else's it's, it's his own ideas and they're often outdoor themes. He is an outdoorsman and, and uh, he's invented his own techniques and done his own kind of thing. Okay, and then the next one we're going to look at, which is right next to it here, is called Prostrate and it's by Paul Nelson. Yeah, Paul was a, was a student here uh, and we got to know him very early in his student career, and we actually have more pieces by Paul Nelson than we do by any other artist, and they're sort of spread through his career. 
and this is the second of his pieces that we have. This was made uh, towards the end of his student career. It's a cast piece, and then it's been electroplated. This is copper that's been electroplated onto the piece. Uh, and and uh, he's a very talented uh, person. And the piece grabbed us, although he was only a student at the time. We still love it as a as a representation of his work. Yeah, that's wonderful. You could get it so early in his career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next, let's move over to the center. Okay. Next one we have is. Synergy, okay, that's, Synergy 2. That's the big one. Uh, by Hannah Kippax. Hannah Kippax is a, is a relatively unknown British artist. Uh, and, and we have not ever met her. Uh, and we bought this piece without ever having seen any of her work in person. She won a prize of some sort as a student in England, and we saw an article about her with a picture of the, of the prize-winning piece, and we loved it. And I emailed her and asked if that piece was available. Mm -hmm. And she said no. Oh. But she said, I'm really not happy with the piece, and I'd like to make it again, and I'd like to make it bigger, and I'd like to make it stronger. Uh, I think there are ways of making it emotionally stronger than it mm -hmm. was. And so what it turned out was if we wanted to commission it, she would do it. Wow. So okay. we commissioned it and it took about two years because the first time she tried to cast it, it broke. Oh gee. <laughs> and she had to make it again. Uh, but it, I think it's a very strong uh, emotional piece, and uh, it's it's actually quite lovely. And it, it's interesting that she went to um, the Czech Republic to cast to cast the piece, because oh, okay. they're the best piece. That's the best place in the world to cast glass. They're the most knowledgeable. Great. Next piece we're going to look at is uh, trapezoidal form by Harvey Littleton. Yeah, this is this is a historical piece among other things. Harvey Littleton is the person who is generally credited with starting the American contemporary glass movement. He was a ceramics professor at the University of Wisconsin and he developed <coughs> a, a small furnace that a single artist could use uh, and eventually started a glass course at the University of Wisconsin from which many of the early glass artists in the United States graduated. Uh, this is a later piece of Littleton's. This is a 1990 piece, uh, which is about 30 years after he began. Uh, but its appeal is both that it is uniquely Littleton. You can look at it and know that it's a Littleton piece and also the historical value. Right. And then just above that, we have a piece by Stefan Dam, who's Danish, uh, called Flower Black. And that's kind of typical of his style, correct? That's very typical of his style. If you think about um, the paperweights you saw when you were a kid with the snowman inside, mm -hmm. well, he uses somewhat, one would call the paperweight technology. He will use flame working to make the delicate uh, inner workings and then cast them in, cast them in uh, clear glass. Mm -hmm. In what we met the artist at the show where he was, where this was displayed, and we and we bought it, and we asked him what was the inspiration, and it turns out his compost pile. Uh. Since I'm a gardener, <laughs> I related to that. Right. He said he took his he took a magnifying glass and looked at all the creepy crawlies and the organisms in his compost pile. And, he got some inspiration. He certainly did. <laughs> much great. better looking than a compost. Pile. Yes, much better looking. <laughs> okay, we're going to move back to the wall here then to look at just a couple other pieces. Uh, first one would be Foundation for Chaos by John Wolfe, who also, I guess, got his degree at the university. He did. John, right John Wolfe is the son of 
Ralph Wolf, who is a uh, well-known uh, professor at the University of Illinois, he was raised in Champaign-Urbana, uh, took the glass program here, uh, and uh, for some years had a studio in the area. Uh, he has now left the area and he isn't doing much uh, glass art anymore. This piece takes some looking at to, to figure out what it is. Uh, down at the bottom, it turns out there is a man on his hands and knees. Oh, That's yeah. his head. There are his hands and there are his feet. And then there is this cement block and there is a city on the top. So ah. this is sort of the atlas holding up the world thing right. uh, in a in a more contemporary version. The uh, other interesting thing about this piece is that it's made with vitrolite. Vitrolite is a, used to be an architectural material. It was the front of movie theaters and, and Five and dimes, stores. when ah. they had five and dimes. Okay. Five and okay. dime stores. It's all these colored pieces. And Bill Carlson, who taught the glass program here, is one of the very first people to use vitrolite in an artistic way, and John Wolfe was his student. Right. And so you see even things like that are passed from teacher to student. Okay. Next piece we're going to look at is right here in the middle. And uh, this is his unusual title. It's question mark to exclamation point, ah, romance. And it's by Jean Marie Ferraro. This is a different piece. Most people don't recognize that it's glass, mm -hmm. uh, but it is the, the pot de verre technique where you take uh, colored glass and grind it fairly thinly and then uh, put some kind of a binder with it, some kind of oil, uh, sometimes gum arabic is used, and then you can put that mixture into a mold and you can place it very carefully. So normally, pot de verre is used to get really good gradations of color because you can place the colored glass so that you mm -hmm. blend the colors and it stays there when you put the mold into the kiln. She's used it more to get texture than to get color. Right. Uh, and in fact, there's very little color change in this piece. Uh, but she placed the the pot the there into a mold and then kiln fired it to get the, the fusing of the glass and get the nice texture. Okay. And I, it's, it's got a really nice feel. You almost see this woman stepping out of the wall. <laughs> yes, it almost does look like that. Okay, the next piece is a Five Hex by Stephen DeVries. Um, he's working, I guess, in the West right now. So. Okay, so uh, this is the first glass piece we ever bought. It's the one mm. that caught our eye. Ah, I can see why. And as, as John said, the optical, the optical qualities, um, it's clear mm -hmm. piece, uh, pieces of lead glass mm -hmm. uh, joined together, it's all cold work, nothing is hot, mm -hmm. joined together with the kind of glue that they use um, in lenses. Oh, okay. So, so it, the, the uh, material connecting the plates together, you can see right through. Mm -hmm. Now the interesting thing about Stephen DeVries is that he was a glass, he was based in Denver, he was a glass artist for a few years, then he stopped making glass art and went into architectural glass like wash basins. Oh, okay. Then he stopped glass altogether and became uh, making chocolate for chocolatiers. So oh. he travels the world finding <laughs> <cho> cocoa beans <laughs> and makes his chocolate and sells his chocolate. Yeah. And I have yet to see a sculpture in chocolate, I mean, that he's done. Uh -huh. but we just recently, we saw a sculpture in chocolate we did, in Dallas. But not his. Okay, but, not his. But, but the style is similar still? Oh, no, 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 no. The last time we saw him in Denver, he brought a whole bunch of different chocolate and he, we did a chocolate taste. Oh, how there. nice. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Tune in next week for the conclusion of this two-part Art Now episode.